That means that's a, it was a noise, right? There's no support, it's a cost, so it doesn't change. So, so the cost doesn't go down by removing one point. So then, uh, or goes down very slightly, not significantly. So what does that mean? Is that a valid point or is that a valid, valid point? Valid point. So that's a valid point. If it was one of the noisy points, then the cost will have some value. Then the cost will significantly go down, right? So if we just or we, or rather than randomly, I can go into a loop of seven, remove one. If the cost goes down, eliminate that point significantly. Okay, so maybe, you know, let's pretend this is the outlier. Okay, so we'll end up removing it because as soon as I remove it, the cost will significantly decrease. So then I'll be left with six. Very similarly, later on, maybe there will be another point over here. I don't know which one, but let's pretend it's one of these or uh, or one of these, right? So if I remove that, the cost will further decrease. So, so that's exactly what I did over here. I went into a loop. All seven points, keep, if I remove the point, cost goes significantly down, I remove it. So then I'm down to six. Then I keep going. If another point is removed, cost further goes down, then that's an outlier. So take a look what happens if I run that code. Okay, now the cost is 0 0.54, and those are perfectly aligned. Okay, so the question is, um, is this a good approach uh, in general? Okay, if I have only seven points, or 10 points. You can go 10 times in a loop. Uh, how many times you have to compute the transformation matrix? 10 times, right? Each time you remove, you have to compute the transformation matrix again on the remaining points. Uh, so for 10 or so correspondence points, it's no big deal. But if the correspondences are, let's say, in the thousands, then it would be pretty bad, right? So this is where another algorithm is typically used. So in most of the computer vision work, if we have to remove noise, there's an algorithm called RANSAC uh, for removing outliers. It's a simple algorithm. Okay. Um, the basic idea is very simple. The basic idea is, uh, so now pretend, uh, so assume correspondence are in hundreds of points, hundreds or thousands of points. Okay, and some of these are outliers. So we wanted to remove them. So the way it works is, rather than iteratively going one at a time, what we typically do in RANSAC is select, let's say, n random points. n could be, for example, 10 or 15 or whatever. Okay. So based on those 10 selected random points, we create the transformation. Uh, and uh, see what is the cost now in the overall model, okay? Um, then we, uh, we randomly select a few other points. We add to this to see whether it improves the cost or uh, makes it worse. And we repeat this process many, many times. So, so in other words, rather than doing it iteratively over all data, we are now doing a random sampling of the data to decide what would be a proper model. So let me... Professor, is it like a mini batch? We are feeding batches instead of the entire images? Correct, and the batches are uh, randomly selected. So not in any sequence. Okay. So anyway, if you go to Wikipedia, and do a search on RANSAC. Okay. So if I do RANSAC. 
Let's see. So that's what the it stands for random sample concept consensus. Okay, you can read the description later. Like I said, it's basically um, so they used to have a really good animation of how it is picking the sample randomly and gradually making it better and better, but uh, now they've removed that animation for some reason. Okay, but anyway, so as you can see in this particular case, uh, as you can see, uh, this is our data, which is proper data, and we wanted to fit this with a straight line. Okay? Obviously, all of these are outliers, so they are the noisy data. So the question is, how can we come up with uh, a straight line? So the way the algorithm will work is, okay, so randomly you'll pick some points. Let's say you pick this, some points over here. Okay, so you'll try to create a line which, you know, based on our linear least squares as an example, uh, which fits best to whatever uh, sample we picked, right? So then we will try to uh, add more points, and very similarly, we'll pick, pick another set of random points. So we keep picking this. Hopefully, one of these might be something like this. And then obviously, the cost of this model will be better than any other model, and we'll keep that. So let me show you the steps of the algorithm. So here's the pseudocode for the algorithm. Okay, so we are given some data, set of observations, uh, <coughs> model. Uh, so model could be, you know, two parameters like A and B. If we are doing a straight line fit, it could be three parameters. If we are doing a second order approximation, uh, it could be A, B, T1, T2. If we are doing an image registration, okay, uh, anyway. Uh, n is the minimum number of data points required to estimate the model. Okay, so for example, if we are doing image registration, we might say we need minimum three points okay, uh, to register the two images. Or we may say five points. Okay. Um, k times we will repeat it. And uh, threshold, and we'll define uh, and D is the number of closed data points that we'll say if we uh, add them, it still, you know, is okay. But anyway, so this is what it goes through. But as I mentioned, it's really, so we s go into this loop. Iterations is less than K. Okay, uh, best fit is of our model. So in our case, if we are doing image registration, it could be A, B, T1, T2. Right? So take a look at this part. N randomly selected values from the data. So if we had 500 correspondences, we may pick five of those correspondence points. Uh, and those are, um, uh, so anyway, uh, so those are our uh, inliers. Okay. Uh, model parameters fit it to maybe in liars. So for those five, we'll do the, compute the transformation matrix, and it will give us a B, T1, T2. Okay. Uh, so for every data point that's not in this, if the point fits maybe model with the error smaller than T, add this to the in liars. Okay. If the number of elements in, is greater than B, then, so, so to give you an idea, okay, let's say n is 5 in the way. Let's say d is the, uh, let's say 30, okay? Or 20 doesn't matter, let me make it easy, make it, or let's make it 10 for it now, okay? So basically, we started with five random points. We computed the transformation matrix for those five points. Okay. Then, basically, for every point that's not in the, we randomly picked a point. 
and we added it to the model to see is the cost going down um, with some parameter that we will set in the beginning. If it reduces more than by t, then that gets added to the in liars. Okay. So once we reach 10 in liars, okay, we stop. Okay. That means this is a decent model. Okay. Uh, so then we store that model. Okay. And we also, whatever the error was, we record that error. And then basically, like I said, we'll repeat this whole process k times. We may decide to repeat it 30 times or 50 times. And whatever at the end is our best model uh, will be our uh, final transformation matrix. Okay. So I had a pretty good um, example showing you all of this on image registration. And I had programmed it in OpenCV. Uh, okay, see the way OpenCV, uh, there was like version 2 point something, then it went to version 3. I think the latest is version 4 or something. Anyway, so somewhere here I had programmed it. Okay, so the first question is, if we are given two images. So let's say I have an image of a car. Okay, and let's say here's another image of a car. Some other car, it doesn't have to be. Okay, and let's pretend I wanted to know what are the correspondences between these two. See, for a human face, like I said, the eyes uh, or the nose or the chin may be, you know, a good indicator of the correspondence point. So here, uh, there could be several correspondence points. Okay, for example, this may be a good correspondence point. This may be another correspondence point. Okay, so the question is, how do we decide uh, what are the correspondence points, and how do we even determine where is the correspondence point between the two? Okay, so now we are coming to the next question. Our next question is determining correspondence points. Okay, um, so let's say we use some algorithm, and I'll elaborate on that algorithm soon, and we came up with 500 correspondences. Okay, see, if this picture was taken, there might be on some day, there might be a cloud over here, right? When this picture was taken, the cloud may be somewhere there. So uh, it may say, oh, this corresponds to over here. <laughs> but should really be part of our model? No. No, it will destroy our transformation, our registration. So as you can see, now there are outliers appearing. So the typical procedure that we follow is we determine correspondence points using some algorithm. And I'll go into the details of these algorithms. Okay, for example, for face alignment, okay, there's an algorithm called active shape model. And I briefly showed it to you in the last lecture. Okay, where it can find 68 points on like the eyes, the uh, curvature of the chin and so on, uh, uh, nose and lips and so, so anyway, so, so this is one algorithm. Uh, but it only works for faces. What about cars or trees or something else, right? So then uh, for other cases, like this example over here. We use SIFT, which stands for Scale Invar Invariant Feature Transform, or CERT. Okay. So anyway, uh, what I was describing, I had a really cool example to show where I use SIFT and CERT 
and uh, I compute the correspondences. Okay, but uh, is, uh, in the example, uh, if I had it running properly on my computer, you'll see, for example, this corresponds to this, this corresponds to this, this cloud corresponds to this. So anyway, it will come up with literally hundreds of correspondences. Okay, some of them will look perfect. You can look at it and see, oh yeah, it does make sense. Some of them, for example, it might think that this point is really this point over here. Because there's a sort of an edge involved, sort of edge involved. So, so this algorithm is not perfect. It will do many correspondences which are wrong. Okay, so how do we eliminate those? What algorithm do we use? Answer. 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 Okay. So uh, anyway, I had a really beautiful example of this all program with showing you wrong alignments in RANSEC. Unfortunately, this algorithm over here uh, is patented. Yeah. So they used to put it in OpenCV before, up to version 2. Um, and they had it for a while in version 3 as well, but I think they got in trouble. Whoever had the patent said, you know, you can't be distributing to everybody in the world. So the latest download of OpenCV does not have that algorithm. So anyway, on my old laptop where I had the old version of OpenCV, I have it. <laughs> so someday I'll bring my old laptop. It's, it's kind of funny. You take a look at old laptops, they are this thick and this big. <laughs> but uh, uh, So I can't demonstrate it to you. Okay. Uh, but what we'll try to do is, uh, so in the OpenCV now, they have a slightly different algorithm. It's called ORB. And they have some variations of it, which accomplish pretty much the same as SIFT and SERF. Okay, but what I'd like you to do is also understand how SIFT and SERF work, because all these ORBs are basically variations of the same idea. Okay, so, uh, so let me sidetrack, um, show you the fundamental ideas behind uh, SIFT, and then what exactly is SERF, then you guys will program the ORB algorithm, and then you will do the outlier removal, and hopefully you will see how the whole thing works. Okay, so let me go at least 10 more minutes, and then so that you guys have an idea of... Okay, and by the way, coming back to your assignment, Okay, very briefly, let me show you. If you go to assignment five now. Okay, uh, so this is, so the first part is straightforward. Like I said, all you have to do is solve partial C over partial B. Uh, partial C over partial T1 and T2, write the equation, assemble the matrix. And since you have the final result, you can compare if you made a mistake. Okay, so that's easy. Then here's the code. So this is the code I was demonstrating to you. Okay, uh, the only thing that's missing over here is, for example, uh, the point is a pre-built class. Okay, shape is a list that you will... Uh, so I gave this to you. The code for displaying a shape is also given to you. Okay. And I also gave you, once you assemble the A matrix, how you will compute the transformation matrix, like res equal to. Okay, so I didn't give you 100% of the code, but uh, hopefully this will give you enough to. Uh, put it together so that at least you can have it running like I showed it to you over here. So you click on a button, it will show you the two shapes, then you apply the transformation, it will display the two shapes. Okay. Uh, anyway, so that's the uh, assignment. 
So now let's go to, for 10 minutes today, and then I'll finish it next time, show you the SIFT algorithm, how it works. So the SIFT algorithm, okay, if you go to kb.bridgeport.edu, cbd 785, if you go to the handouts, Okay, so again, what I did is rather than creating my own PowerPoint, uh, somebody had a very, very nice, in my opinion, a, a good description of the algorithm. So you can see this is from University of Utah, SURF algorithm. Uh, so we'll just follow those slides because uh, our goal is just to get a good idea of the understanding of the algorithm. You won't be programming the algorithm, like I said, uh, because it's a patented algorithm, you'll be using the ORB algorithm, which is very similar to it, uh, available in OpenCV. Uh, as you use it so that you know what's it doing behind the scenes, uh, our goal is to understand how is this working. So anyway. So this is what those slides are. Okay, uh, let me give you an uh, uh, idea of uh, what's the goal of this particular algorithm, right? So let's take a look at the picture of a car. Okay, so if we were doing registration, we will need two images, the reference image, but SURF doesn't care. SURF works only on a single image. Okay, uh, I'll show you how we use SURF on two images to do the uh, registration, but SURF or SIF, and by the way, SURF is basically a faster version of S uh, SIF. Okay, uh, so anyway, the goal of the SURF is, is to determine points of interest. Okay, we call this points of interest feature points. Okay, so the question is what is a good feature point? Okay, if we were given a picture of a car, okay, like this, will this be a good feature point? No, no, no. See, it has to have something you know, distinguishing, uh, would this be a good feature point? Sure. How about this one? Yeah. Well, perhaps, right? Okay. Um, so, so the question is, what are good feature points? Okay, so according to SURF, a, a, a good feature point is, which is rotational invariance. Invariant. Okay, what does that mean? Meaning, let's say, this picture of a car was given to you, and you have this point. If I rotated this image, and now this became like something like, okay, will we be able to still consider this a good feature point? Okay, uh, so uh, so if the that point of interest stays important even if we rotate the image, it is a good. So that's what we mean, rotational invariance, meaning it's still an important point even if we rotate, right? Uh, very similarly, what if we make it smaller? Okay, uh, is this still, so that's called the scale space. Uh, whether we are zoomed in or we are far away, it should still be uh, a, a, a important point, right? So, uh, so rotation invariance, scale invariance is very important. Okay. Um, what would be an example of, the, for example, the first big picture, a point that we think it's important that when, when we scale or rotate, doesn't, is not important anymore? Uh, okay, let's take a look at, let's say, a, a soccer ball as an example, right? Uh, Let's say there's inside the ball, there's another like uh, uh, color batch, batch, right? If I rotate this ball, um, I guess.
guess that's not a good example. Uh, uh, yeah, most of the points I can think of, yeah, will continue to be, uh, but not necessarily with zooming in, zooming out. Okay, see like, for example, to give you an example, right? Let's say I have a tree. These are the leaves. Okay, what happens if I zoom out? It's a dot. Uh, like you're looking at a tree from a far away, you'll notice that it becomes blurry, right? Uh, so this may not be a good feature point because you lose that as you zoom in or zoom out. So from scale point of view, uh, uh, so I have to think of a good rotation example. But uh, yeah, that, that that one is a good one for the zoom. The rotation I can use. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I think that soccer ball might work. Okay, let's say, let's take a look at this one, right? Okay, um, let's say I have a point over here. Okay, and let's, let me make a few lines over here in this soccer ball. Okay, now, this point somewhere over here. So let's say here's what we picked, right? Okay, if I rotate this ball, right? So this becomes something like this. Okay, uh, the problem is it may still think, uh, because if it was going by the difference between and not really looking at the overall things, it may still think uh, that's the point, but actually, this point has been rotated and it's really somewhere else. Uh, so, um, so, uh, so, so picking that point as a feature point may not be a good idea because it's so uh, symmetrical uh, that. Uh, so, if it was like some kind of an edge, right? If we rotate, it became, became like this. Uh, so, so those, so that the, we can establish a correspondence as we rotate things. Uh, meaning, let me see if I can further clarify. Let's say I have a book. Okay, if I rotated this book. Okay, um, so what I want is if there was like, let's say, a circle over here, a circle over here. If if it was in the center of this uh, circle, that would be a good feature point because I can maintain how it rotated and determine the angle of rotation through this feature point. But if it was like somewhere on top of the circle, then we don't know whether it may still, as we rotate, it may still show up in the same spot. Uh, meaning at the top, not at some angle. I see, I see. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a little bit. Uh, anyway, so uh, SIFT and SERP, basically their idea is locate features uh, such that as we scale them, as we rotate, they are still uh, appearing in the rotated spot or the scaled spot, so they are still good. Okay. So a couple more minutes. Um, okay, the surf algorithm goes like this: generate feature back. So basically, points of interest. Then, okay. So this is related to our registration and so on. We'll come this back to this later. Okay. Um, Okay, fine, okay, let's just today just take a look at the first point and then we'll continue. Find image interest points. So the question is given an image, what are the points of interest in it, right? Okay, uh, so you guys have already seen uh, a first derivative image in X or in Y or second derivative uh, 
uh, right? So uh, the first derivative, for example, if this is a table, right? As we are moving uh, it in the x direction, it will produce a high value if there's a change. Okay, the second derivative, if you recall from your calculus background, uh, lets us know whether this is a maximum point or the minimum point, right? Okay, so, so uh, according to the SIFT or SURF algorithm, those points are important where the determinant of the Hessian matrix is high, okay? Uh, what is a Hessian matrix? Hessian is again a common, it's basically a derivative a second derivative in the x direction, x and y, y and x, and y and y. So if we compute the second uh, derivative uh, uh, in the x, 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 y, y, x, and assemble this, uh, right, then compute the determinant of this, and if we put a threshold on it, so if it is above a threshold, then it's a good point of interest. If it is below a threshold, it's not a good point of interest. So then once we, so as you will see, this will give us hundreds of points. This Hessian matrix, hundreds of potential feature points. So then what do we do? Then further, we filter these based on which of these points are still valid if we zoomed it in, zoomed it out, right? Um, which of these points are still valid if we rotated it, they'll still maintain the, the rotation uh, and we'll be able to determine it. So then we filter these based on these and finally based on whatever is left, we'll uh, create some kind of a uh, descriptor for it, like a set of values to indicate what that point means. Okay, so that's the idea behind this algorithm. So, okay, so let me stop at this point, and next time we'll continue and finish this this particular algorithm.